welcome to this presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Joseph Jeffrey. I am the District Learning Commons Teacher Librarian for School District 57, Prince George. Um, and um, I'm on the board for Canadian School Libraries. And I'm going to talk to you today about Leading Learning's 2023 updates. And I'm not sure why the uh, the title is not showing, and with how technology has been today, I'm going to just leave it. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that I am on the traditional territory today of the Kwantlen, Katsi, and Samia Mu um, nations, um, and I arrive to you today uh, having come from the Klaitli Keo, or um, the traditional unceded territory of the Klaitli Tanay, um, otherwise known as Prince George. So um, we're going to start off with a quick history of leading learning and what it is. Um, then we're going to go on to uh, what has changed. So um, leading learning is was first developed in 2014 by the Canadian Library Association. And it was uh, a large project done by uh, consultation with uh, school library leaders across uh, Canada, uh, creating a set of standards uh, for growth within libraries and to really push library learning commons as the way forward as we move into the 21st century and look at where we want to go as we um, become a more and more connected world. And Unfortunately, in 2016, the Canadian Library Association dissolved and leading learning was transferred over to the newly formed Canadian School Libraries Association. Uh, in 2018, uh, there was a small update to leading learning um, as um, a sort of first pass update. And then in 2020, the decision was made to try and move leading learning from a static PDF to a website that could be more easily updated. And once that work was done, the idea was this was a living document that would be updated regularly, um, but that ended up not being how it happened. It wasn't updated until 2023 when we came together and did a very large update to it. And you can expect um, there will be continued updates to leading learning. Uh, it might not be uh, in drips like we had intended, but the idea is to keep it updated and keep it relevant as we move forward. So what is leading learning and what are the components? Well, leading learning has five different standards of practice. And as I said, this is a Canadian wide context. It's not uh, particular to one province. Uh, BC does have from library to learning commons, which uh, puts things in a more BC perspective. But this was developed for the whole of Canada. And so our five standards are facilitating collaborative engagement to cultivate and empower a community of learners, advancing the learning community with, to achieve school goals, cultivating effective instructional design to co-plan, teach and assess learning, fostering literacies to empower lifelong learners, and designing learning environments to support participatory learning. And so each of these five standards has a number of themes, like sub pieces underneath it. And each of these themes has a growth uh, piece to it. And so each has four growth stages. Exploring is just sort of you're, you're thinking about it, but you haven't got made it. But then the four major growth stages are emerging, evolving, established, and leading into the future. And so very few, if any, libraries are going to be into leading into the future in every aspect. Some are probably not in leading to the future in any aspect, and that's absolutely OK. But the idea is that this gives you a sort of rubric to work with and a place to look at and go, OK, here's where I am and here's where I could be going. And each aspect uh, each of those themes has exemplars that you can see what other people are doing and see some examples of what this looks like in action. And so 
at Treasure Mountain Canada 7, which was held in New Westminster this time last year, uh, attached to the BCTLA conference last year, uh, we had an exercise. And it was an exercise in two parts. The first one was what was missing from leading learning. So we had to brainstorm as a group, uh, as groups, what we thought wasn't already in each of the areas. And then we had to categorize those into existing standards as best we could. And we had all five standards plus a column for it doesn't go in any. And so the idea was two pronged. One, do we need a new standard? Or do we need to move from five to six? And the second was, what have we missed so far? And so we identified out of that nine new themes that came up again and again that we really needed to address. And these were added across all five of the standards. So the first is facilitating in facilitating collaborative engagement, national and global engagement. This is both for students and for teachers. And it's about both teacher librarians engaging on the national level, engaging on the global level, reaching out to partner organizations like Canadian School Libraries and IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations, but also on a student level about connecting with others across Canada and across the world as part of um, our interconnected world and how we can reach out using modern technology, especially the technologies that have become commonplace since the pandemic. Um, advancing the learning community. Um, we added in leading action for school and board improvement. And this one is very much one that leads on from what was there, um, but really focuses on the specifics of you have a school plan for student success in BC or an equivalent school plan in various other provinces. At the board level, you have a strategic plan. And again, in other provinces, it's called different things. But that's the basic thing that every school has some sort of school goals every board has some sort of goals and where they want to go and as teacher librarians we should be looking at those things and helping align our practice to them for one thing it's a great advocacy tool because it helps those school-based leaders those district-based leaders see how we fit in because they are very focused on those points because that's what they're being measured on. So when we can start talking in their language, talking in terms of the strategic plan, talking in terms of the school plan for student success, we can really get their attention and help them see how we can do things and how we can improve um, the whole school. And so um, the uh, exemplar for one of these is one that I did when we went through our uh, strategic plan visioning. After that was done, I took the strategic plan and looked at all the different things that were going on in our schools uh, for school libraries and library learning commons and categorized them into the, the strategic plan and then took it back to senior admin and went, look, this is what your libraries are already doing. In before year one begins, this is what we are doing to meet what you want. And so you can take this to the board immediately and say, well, we've got all of this going on. This is the kind of things we're going to really encourage. And that helped them see, oh, school libraries are not isolated from the rest of the, the school. They actually do something. And some of them understood that already and some didn't. And so it really can, especially if they've not experienced what um, uh, school libraries can really look like. For instance, in our district, we don't have uh, any requirement for uh, school librarians to be trained. Uh, teacher librarians do not have to have training in our district. So there can be a wildly different variance in quality and of instruction with some of our best being people that are not trained, but some uh, 
also who are struggling because they are just put into it for a year and it's not what they're passionate about. So really getting them to understand that. Fostering literacies. Uh, building reader skills and capacity is what we added here. And this is about the fact that as students become more proficient in other areas, especially around technologies, we need them to still have the fortitude when reading to be able to sustain it and to be able to uh, engage in critical activities when their attentions are being changed by things like TikTok and the brevity of information in that. And so trying to build both the fundamental skills base of things like uh, phonetic reading and stuff like that, as well as uh, other pieces around reading, um, reading research, but also the capacity piece that is often not there when we lose things like silent reading time or we lose things like sustained reading time. And again, in BC, those things seem to be more normal to have than maybe other provinces. And hearing what's going on in other provinces, a lot of that is gone in some places. And they don't do things like silent reading every day in elementary school and those capacity building pieces. So again, some of this is not going to be relevant as much to the BC context because we already do it. And that's going to bring us to our next piece, cultivating effective instructional design. STEAM and maker pedagogies is something we were absolutely shocked we had never really touched on, considering how mm, important it is both to the Library Learning Commons model and also to what we as Canadian school libraries have been doing for years. And yet we had sort of left it out. Um, things you don't notice. Um, so again, in, for the BC context, this isn't as important because we have our ADST curriculum that lays out a pretty good ADST model that takes us through uh, the different steps of design. But most provinces don't have that. They don't have something that takes you through things like uh, blueprinting and designing and ideating and prototyping, all of those pieces. And so that's what this was about, was the pedagogical piece of uh, making instead of freeform play, which has its place as well. We didn't want to say don't do freeform play as part of your maker space, but when how do we acknowledge and get people towards the instructional piece? Because that's what this section is about: instructional design. Indigenous ways of knowing and being as well was an area we realized was frankly missing, and we needed to put in again from a BC context. We have a curriculum that uh, winds um, Indigenous ways of knowing and being throughout everything. And that's meant to be a part of it. But if we take it to the Ontario context, they have that all ready to go. It was meant to be rolled out. And then when a government came in, they removed it. And so um, that was never launched in Ontario. So it's still missing from their curriculum. And so, again, this is a piece where we really need to hit the Canadian context. Um, but it's important that we understand how Indigenous ways of knowing and being fit into the library context as well in the hidden curriculum. Things like uh, what Surrey is doing with um, re, uh, reorganising their Indigenous collection and finding different ways to catalogue and different ways to... Uh, organize information. Inquiry project management. Uh, we have inquiry already in there. But this is about the elements of inquiry that we often forget to teach and we need to be more explicit about. Things like time management and organizational skills, especially as we move towards more personalized learning uh, within the library. Um, and we're doing inquiry projects where people are not necessarily doing the same thing, we really need to attend to how do we get students to understand what 
their timelines are, how do we make sure that we're checking in on a regular basis, that we are aware of what has been turned in and where their stop points are and where their checkpoints are. And so really uh, emphasizing the pieces of inquiry project management and those aspects of both the physical side and also the digital tools that can be used to help simplify things by using things like shared drives or portfolio software. Technology for learning was an aspect that existed, but it was not labeled properly. What was in there was all about the infrastructure pieces rather than about the learning pieces. And so we, we ended up moving that and you'll see that in a moment. Uh, and instead we focused on the instructional piece of technology here. And so we brought it back to what is it we want students to be able to do and how do we want them to grow in technology and utilize it for learning. Designing the learning environments. Um, this was about um, uh, two aspects. The first was designing for the individual. Again, that personalized learning piece that I've mentioned we're aware that most schools are not at the point of doing personalized learning yet. And yet it is something that is becoming more common. And as we are building this towards the future and leading towards the future, we need to acknowledge things that are happening and um, be ready for it. And again, not every library is going to be at the same point in everything. And that's absolutely fine. Um, my library definitely wouldn't be at the point of designing for the individual. Um, it probably would be emerging in that area. And that's just the nature of where the school atmosphere is and different things. And so um, it's just something to that we wanted to include because it was brought up as something that is happening more and more, especially in places like uh, online, fully online schools or hybrid schools that have become more common across Canada since the pandemic. Uh, designing learning environments. Uh, sorry, designing for transparent knowledge building in the library learning commons. This one actually started quite a big discussion around what we were trying to say here. And what it comes down to is if your principal or someone else walks into your library, how do they know what the learning is. And that question actually led us to realizing questions like that, those framing, a framing provocation like that actually is really useful for understanding what it is that we're trying to do. And so we ended up adding the framing provocations in to all aspects of the, um, uh, this. In every single one, we um, we added in the framing provocations to every theme, including the new ones and the old ones, really tried to uh, distill what it is that we wanted to get across with each of these themes. And so those have been added to everything. Um, yeah, uh, so an example of a framing provocation is the one I, I gave that... Um, we, if if you walk into the library for transparent knowledge building, what uh, what is it that uh, you would see? What is it uh, that someone would be able to say that is what um, what's going on um, for um, differentiated learning? Um, it might be. Um, I would have to go into my document to see. Um, I'll try and give you an example at the end because I don't want to say one and it be wrong. Um, in fact, what I'll do is I'll get it up on screen and then I can read it to you. Need to go to my other site. Um, so let's go to instructional design and i'll give you an example of framing provocation so for instructional leadership how might we empower the school learning community around instructional practice and pedagogy 
uh, for Indigenous ways of knowing and being, First Nations, Métis and Inuit ways, is traditional skills and knowledge. How might we build student capacity for intercultural understanding, empathy and mutual respect? Those were uh, some of the framing provocations that we uh, came up with for that. So, um, what would working on the physical space be for services? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand what that, uh, what the question is for that, uh, Maria. Sorry, it's hard to type it. Um, so I want to work like my library right now is not very user friendly, I would say, and so like yeah. kind of working on the space and making it more enjoyable and more accessible for students like there's just lacking of labeling and such like i just want to work on the space it's like a really kind of basic it's a, cool, it's a oh, great question and um you just hold on a few minutes i'm actually going to introduce you to something that hopefully will help you with that okay thank you <laughs> so oh um uh so then there were also four other themes that we updated as well as those framing qualifications. Student voice and community partnership, we added in a lot more around the student voice and helping students use their voice both within the library learning commons, but also amplifying it outside and how um, that piece to um, uh, respectful citizenship piece works and you'll notice that as well in the fostering literacies uh cultivating effective instructional design um for the differentiated learning piece that we changed uh we had some outdated um things in there that uh, as modern uh research into psychology has said just isn't there so things like learning styles and that kind of stuff that just we were naming different um uh, things that just weren't um, have been discredited, and so we we ended up removing references to those and making it more general, so that um, uh, we avoided that uh, issue in in the future as uh, research evolves and tells us more about the human brain, especially about the childhood and teenage brain. Um, and fostering literacies, uh, digital media literacy was always there we added citizenship into it. Um, so uh, Jennifer Cassa Todd is a Canadian uh, educator and author, and she wrote a book a few years ago called Social Media, which I highly recommend. Uh, but it really focuses on the citizenship piece of social media and um, how social media can be used for good. Um, and so that was something we wanted to capture as part of this. The digital media literacy often is about the scariness of the internet, but we really wanted to get people to understand it has pos there are positive aspects for leadership in there that we often don't get. And so we really uh, focused on that. Um, and that is also something that fits in with what Media Smarts, uh, the provincial organization, uh, sorry, a national organization that um, works on uh, different media literacy strategies for students and for teachers to teach from, uh, is espousing as well as civics also espouses that, which is another um, uh, national uh, organization involved in citizenship. Um, designing learning environments. So I mentioned earlier that we ended up moving the one about infrastructure, and that's this one here. We renamed it Designing for Effectively Leveraging Technology in the Library Learning Commons, and it is about sort of that infrastructure piece uh, that often we don't have the ability to change, whereas the cultivating instructional practice, or sorry, cultivating effective instructional design, we, we do have the ability to change that. And so there's more. Um, we got to the end of this project and there were leftover elements that didn't fit in properly. What should be in the library learning commons? What technology? What kind of physical elements should be in it? What digital elements? What? Well, we needed something that explained the basics. 
uh, we needed something that people could refer to that gave sort of lists of this is the kind of thing you should be looking at doing um, that could be referred to for things like your virtual learning commons website, your physical space, um, your collection, um, your technology. And we looked to what there was out there and we realized the last time this had been done in a Canadian uh, context for a whole Canada wide thing was achieving information literacy which if you've done your master's or even probably your diploma, you've probably heard of because it gets referenced a lot, mainly because it's the last document to really lay this out in, a, um, in the Canada-wide context. And it's from 2003, and um, it was written by uh, doctors Oberg, uh, Branch Mueller, and um, I'm going to forget the last one, um, it's not going to come to me, but uh, Aislinn, uh, Marlene Aislinn. Um, and so they wrote this in 2003. And now here we are 20 years later updating it. So we built it on uh, this new document on leading learning, achieving information literacy, and the IFLA standards that were updated in 2015. Plus, uh, on the committee doing this, we had hundreds of years of experience as teacher librarians uh, across all of us and then it's been or it's being reviewed by the various TL associations across Canada and uh, currently teaching professors across Canada including doctors um, uh, Oberg and Branch Mueller. Uh, even though Dr Oberg has retired uh, she great um, she was gracious enough to I review this and has done substantial work with us on it to make sure it's as good as it can be. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to Foundations for School Library Learning Commons in Canada, a framework for success. This is a prerequisite for successful implementation of leading learning. And it will be found at that address. Uh, it is not available yet. Um, we had hoped originally when we booked this session that it would be available uh, on Monday for Canadian School Libraries Day um, due to um, our main editor getting COVID. Um, that has been pushed back quite a bit. Um, she had a really bad bout of COVID. And so um, uh, it's more likely to be mid-November at this point. I apologize. Um, I would share the document with you, but it's in a draft state but I'm gonna go over a few pieces from it right now. So the foundations that we built on are these, and these are the what we call the critical foundations, the pieces that need to be in place. And these are not necessarily ones that we have control over. This is as much an advocacy piece for you to work with your principal, to work with your um, board, around what these critical foundations are in order for a successful implementation of a library learning commons. The first is strong policy. As we are seeing with book challenges across Canada, if you have weak policy, it is exploitable. You really need to examine what there is when we have um, uh, requests for a reconsideration. And um, those kind of policies that dictate what people can and can't do can be easily abused. If they're not locked to, for instance, you have to have a child in the school district. Um, I know some northern districts in BC have had that problem where they didn't have that in policy and they were just getting inundated with lists of books to remove by random parents, uh, by random people not parents of kids within their district. And they were just, what do we do with this? Well, if you have strong policy, it stops that. The second piece is robust funding. Uh, we all know the state of funding in BC. Um, it isn't where it needs to be. Uh, and I know that the provincial government will say, well, funding is higher than it's ever been. Yes, but so is cost of living, so is cost of everything and most of the funding goes on the people. And 
So as resources age, we're not able to keep up with it because we just do not have the influx of cash into schools to keep up with purchasing of new technology, purchasing of new uh, library materials, furniture, and so on. And so really looking at that, both from a school-based level, a district-based level, and a provincial-based level. Equity of access, uh, that um, there should be a minimum standard for access to a library, that just because your school is small shouldn't mean that your library is only open for one hour on Friday. That there should be ways in which we're looking at how can we access these pieces and how can we make it so that all students have access to a stocked library and a um, trained person who can help them with uh, information issues. So those are our three foundations. And then we have eight frameworks, which we called our essential frameworks. And each of these essential frameworks has a associated appendice that goes over a lot of detail towards what is in them. So I have a draft copy on me, um, and I'm just going to stop the share for a second and um, just show you on my screen. So within this, um, so for instance, your one on um, your question on physical space, we then have um, an appendice that goes over the physical space requirements and like what kind of things we should be looking at as we do this. And so with each of these, frameworks we go into what it is and why it's important and some of the philosoph philosophical pieces but then we give some very concrete examples of what we mean by this in the appendices and so um that is coming and it should be coming hopefully by the end of uh, november um we're due to uh do our final pass uh next week um uh, with all the feedback that we've gathered from uh, the national, uh, uh, sorry, the provincial leaders that are uh, re reviewing this. So the eight frameworks are physical and virtual library learning common spaces, technological infrastructures, human resources, accessibility, ethical standards, library learning common management, a culture of growth and accountability. So I'm just gonna go through what each of these means uh, before we go on too much further. So physical and virtual library learning common space is pretty self-explanatory. It is about what you should expect to be in a modern library learning commons, both the digital aspects and the physical. The technological infrastructures refer to things like Okay, you need to have adequate wireless. You need to have adequate um, electrical outlets. The days of Mickey Mousing this are over. We, we need to get serious as schools about what is there because as buildings age and stuff like that, um, especially as we look at new builds, and there are, quite frankly, some new builds that are absurd, and the BCTLA is also working on its own thing around physical space um, and uh, trying to address that as well. Um, that it, it is just something that needs to really be, uh, attention needs to be paid to. Human resources. Um, so Canadian School Libraries doesn't just represent teacher librarians. It represents all um, school library professionals, which includes your library technicians, clerks, uh, and so on. And in some provinces, they don't have teacher librarians, they have librarians who are trained as a librarian only and have no educational background, or so no background in education. And so that is something to consider as well. And the human resources piece goes through what the different roles are in abstract and why they, how they work together and what kind of scenarios there are for that. 
accessibility is about addressing some of the uh, common accessibility concerns. Uh, when I first got to my high school, um, all of our shelves were so narrow, you couldn't get a, a wheelchair down. Um, and we had two kids in wheelchairs in the school. And no one had thought to go, well, how are they meant to get into these really cramped um, corridors of um, of books? Like, we need to address this. And so stuff like that, um, making sure, for instance, in an elementary school, if you work in one, you're probably very well aware of this already, but you don't put your kindergarten books up on the top shelf. Six year, five and six year olds can't reach them. And the last thing you need is them climbing up because they will try and climb those shelves to reach the cold book that's on the top. Uh, ethical standards. Uh, this is really addressing what we as uh, teacher librarians and other library professionals need to understand around ethics, both the uh, ethics that are involved with adhering to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and also when, with respect to putting our own um, uh, biases aside when it comes to uh, reconsiderations and stuff like that, uh, and realizing that especially libraries are not neutral spaces. We often hear that, especially in terms of academic settings, that, oh, a library is a neutral space. Any information should be allowed to be in there. Well, no, hate information can't be in there. Uh, it just cannot be because that is against the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And so referencing things like UNDRIP, referencing things like the UN Declaration on the Rights of the Child and stuff like that. Like these are ethical things that we as Canadians have uh, through our government signed that we're going to adhere to. So as professionals working in a uh, provincial role uh, under because uh, the federal, then the provincial, as employees of the provincial government's educational wing, we're also bound to those things as well. Uh, library Learning Commons management is about all those tasks that often your principals don't realize we do. The book buying, the um, making sure everything's organized on the shelves, the time to put away, the um, uh, management of the other people in the space, management of schedules and stuff like that, and what that looks like. Um, there's all sorts of tasks that relate to library learning commons management that we just do. And this lays out like what they are and why they're important and gives you something that you can refer to and say, actually, this is something that is part of my job. Um, a culture of growth is really emphasizing those links to leading learning and the fact that we have taken a growth approach with um, foundations and frameworks. And then finally, accountability. Now, we were very careful with the accountability piece that this was not going to be something that an administrator could use to evaluate you. That isn't the purpose of this. But we did want, there needs to be some ways for us to ask for evaluations or ask for the pieces that a general classroom teacher can have. Uh, I have had uh, multiple times when I've requested a teaching evaluation, I've been told by my principal, no, you can't have one because I don't know how to evaluate you. Well, this sort of lays out some ways that both you can do some self-evaluation and self-reflection along with the culture of growth pieces, but also like that you can give to someone else, but not in a way that's going to allow them to be punitive and like critical when they don't understand it. So we're going to do a quick activity. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to a um, resource right now. Um, so we had started this checklist at the very start of our discussions. So, sorry for the interruption. Um, I just want to let everybody know that the keynote will be starting in five minutes. So 
Um, if everybody could he start heading down to the theater for the TV note in a couple of minutes, and that'd be really great. Thank you very much. See you at the, at the theater. Oh, I thought we had more time than that. Um, I guess, um, based on that, I don't know if you could hear that, but apparently the keynote is stopping soon. I thought we had uh, a bit more time than this, um, but uh, I will share the activity all the same because it is a digital activity. So um, what you can do with this is this is uh, the activity and um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so what we have here is a what we were going to do as an a appendix for leading learning, uh, how to lead action for school and board improvement. And so as we looked at it, we realized that the way we want to do this was more of a rubric or a checklist than something that uh was sort of it started off more as just like a long long document um long preamble thing more like this intro is and so we want to look at how we can move the content of this into a rubric what suggestions people have for uh, doing this, uh, how we could better format it so that it is a useful appendix that you could take and go, okay, I understand now what I can do to lead action for school and board improvement. And so this is what we've got right now. This is the document as it is. Um, it has a preamble and then it has a sort of mini checklist with some pieces broken down into it that go, okay, here's what we mean by this. And it's sort of very much just the document with all the text in it, but I formatted some of the text to be check boxes rather than be just full on text. But that isn't what our overall vision is for this. Our overall vision is some sort of rubric that is easy to understand as teachers. So this is a document that is freely available to edit and you can um, work on it whenever you want to. And we're going to uh, take any kind of suggestions that we see in here. We're gonna compare the, this document and the one from the second session, as well as uh, our own notes on it and try and build something that is actually useful to you as a teacher. And so uh, that's where we're going with this and what we want to do. So that's the activity, um, which I'm not going to get us to do right this second, but I, I am going to also put out a call for action. So we have these exemplars on every single one of our themes that helps you see what it can look like. And we are always on the lookout for great examples of what is going on in school libraries across Canada. And particularly, I love that so much of what's in there already is from BC. And I'd love us to continue to dominate in that field because it shows what a powerhouse our province is and how much RTL community leads the way across Canada. And when you're doing this, you can submit a exemplar and I'll show you what that looks like. And hopefully it's jumped over to this um, that will help you um, uh, put up different examples of things you're doing. You can add photos, you could um, uh, you can link us to blogs. You just need to tell us what it is you're uh, submitting to us and we will take it and look at it and see if it fits as a good example for our themes. So finally, what else is there? Well, Canadian School Libraries does a lot of things. Uh, we have a podcast called Read Into This uh, that we sponsor uh, with Beth Leons and Alana King from Ontario. Um, we have Canadian School Libraries Journal, which is an action research focused journal 
um, where uh, teacher librarians across Canada can submit uh, action research that they're doing to be published and shared. Uh, this is a part that really matters for um, enhancing what we've got out there because uh, there isn't a lot of school library focused researchers on the uh, at universities in Canada. Um, the only currently active fully school librarian person is Dr. Branch Mueller at um, um, uh, U of A who focuses solely on school libraries and at the doctorate level. Uh, we have several in uh, really good um, sessional instructors in many of the diploma programs, a lot of which do come from BC, even the Queens and UBC ones. Uh, we have loads that come from there, but we really need to, as a, uh, because universities are not picking up the slack on uh, doing research, we need to, as professionals, do that. Um, and so that's what this journal is about. We have the research toolkit, which helps explain how to do action research in your schools, how you can go about doing it, and how you can make it successful. And finally, we have the collection diversity toolkit, which focuses on how you do things like diversity audits, how you look at your collection for equity uh, informed weeding and collection development, how you assess different parts of your collection in a way that can help you build uh, competency. And so those are our four main publications. Uh, we are going to be working hopefully next year on a digital media literacy one in conjunction with Media Smarts um, that uh, will be a school library focused uh, digital literacy framework, um, which we hope to be doing next um, next year uh, in summer of 2024. Thank you very much for um, all of you for coming and for staying a few minutes uh, extra. Um, yep, yeah, I will put the form link in the chat. Um, just know that in your um, Easy Reg thing, you should have a copy of this slideshow. Um, we've tried to make it available uh, for all of you. And um, thank you very much for coming. Um, I really appreciate that you taking the time and I hope you check out some of the stuff that Canadian School Libraries is doing. And um, I hope to see your names uh, when uh, I'm reviewing uh, some of the uh, journal articles. Uh, our next journal is coming out uh, next week, I think, or the week after. Um, and um, then we'll be taking submissions for the uh, winter journal for next year, uh, winter 2024.